Okay, good morning to everyone. Uh, my name is Ren Florenza. I am the executive president of the European Institute of the Mediterranean. And welcome to the second edition of these uh, AFCAR debates. Uh, you know that AFCAR uh, Ideas uh, is uh, one of the, the publications that we have at the European Institute of the Mediterranean together with uh, Publishing House uh, Politica Exterior. And uh, we have organized these, these uh, webinars, these uh, sessions, because as everybody else, of course, we are extremely worried about uh, the, the events uh, in, in the Middle East, uh, what's going on, uh, previous attacks by Hamas, uh, immense destruction of uh, life of human beings, and the infrastructure uh, in Gaza. And so we are trying uh, to analyze uh, what's going on, what the consequences may be, both at the local, regional, and at the global level. Not only to analyze it, but even to, it's a way of expression of our uh, solidarity with the victims and a way to to contribute in any possible way for a, for a for a peace uh, on the ground and and to stop the war that's going on at such an incredible uh, cost. So we had the first webinar that was uh, dealing with the implications of uh, uh, the conflict. Uh, and this first, it was referred mainly to the global repercussions of the conflict. And so uh, uh, the implications not only of the warring parties, but of uh, global powers, the complex position of Biden administration. Uh, we, we very clearly remember uh, that warning that uh, even President Biden even, uh, himself addressed to the Israelis and not to repeat, he said, our mistakes after 9-11, uh, because that, as you know, was the origin of an immense wave of, of, of violence and war throughout the Middle East. And so uh, at that session, uh, well, the inner dynamics uh, were to be examined in the Israeli and Palestinian societies. And we will see as well the public response uh, and this strong anti-American, anti-Western sentiment that's uh, growing in, in the Arab countries uh, and, uh, well, how it is affecting the overall dynamics in the region. For example, it is very difficult to imagine uh, a continuation of uh, the Abraham Accords as uh, they were being prepared by the United States and the countries uh, in the Middle East uh, and between, as you know, Israel and, and Arab countries. Well, now uh, we have uh, uh, this second session that's, uh, uh, as it was announced, uh, dealing with regional consequences uh, in the Middle East conflict. And uh, we have uh, extraordinary participants. We have uh, Professor Maya Yahya, who is the director of the Malcolm Care Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut, and uh, Maria Luisa uh, Fantapied, who is the head of the Mediterranean, Middle East, and African uh, program at the Instituto Affari Internazionale in Rome. So, Maha and uh, uh, Maria Luisa, uh, welcome to this session. And uh, I will address uh, some questions to one and the other of them. First, I will I will go for a for a, a, a short uh, introduction of who are they, although they are they are very known specialists. But uh, Mahayaya is the director, as I said, of the Madol Care Carnegie Middle East Center, and her work focuses broadly on political violence and identity politics, pluralism, development, and social justice after the Arab uprisings the challenges of citizenship and the political and socioeconomic implications of the migration and refugee crisis. She previously 
uh, held positions in the uh, UN Economics and Social Commission for Western Africa and the UNDP in Lebanon. She also worked as a consultant on projects of development policies, cultural heritage, poverty reduction, housing and community development, and especially post-conflict reconstruction in various countries, including Lebanon, Pakistan, Oman, uh, Jordan, etc. And some of her written publications include Unheard Voices, What Syrian Refugees Need to Return Home, uh, published in, in April 2018, or The Summer of Our Discontent, uh, Sects and Citizens in Lebanon and Iraq. Uh, on the subject, he, uh, she has written about Arab perspectives and, and the conflict and regional dynamics after the attacks and what led to this crisis. Uh, so welcome, uh, Maha. And Maria Luisa Ferrantapie, as I said, is the head of the Mediterranean, Middle East and Africa programs at the Instituto Afar Internacional in Rome. And uh, she's as well a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics Middle East Center. She holds a master's uh, with distinction from Sciences Po in Paris, a PhD from King's College in London, Development of War Studies. Uh, she has worked as a senior advisor at the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue and International at the International Crisis Group, uh, conducting fieldwork across Iraq and the Middle East for over a decade. In 2018, she was seconded by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs as a strategic advisor to the EU mission uh, security sector reform in Baghdad. Her research explores informal power in post-conflict and post-authoritarian settings. Her recent publications include Politicians, Officers, and Political Transactions, the case of post-2003 Iraq. On the topic in question uh, today, she has recently uh, written about a uh, Europe position in the conflict, interregional dialogue, and has recently intervened in an Al Jazeera panel on uh, European policy in Israel and Palestine. So we will start in this uh, dialogue and I, I will address in the first place, the first question I will address like uh, three uh, questions, well, alternative questions uh, to uh, Mahayaya and Maria Luisa Fontapie. Uh, and uh, you, after this first uh, round of uh, questions and answers that uh, we will open at, uh, at the end uh, for the public. I will, we will be receiving questions throughout the session. And so when we finish this first round uh, uh, of questions and answers, about three to each of you, we will uh, present the questions addressed to you by uh, our friends following uh, the session whom I salute very warmly. Thank you for being with us. We know that we had a lot of, of uh, people inscribed in, in the session. So thank you for your interest uh, uh, and for being with us. So I go with the first question to uh, Maha Yaya. Uh, well, the mass attack uh, put again the Palestinian issue back at the center of international politics. Uh, what might recent events mean for Palestinian politics? I mean, internally uh, uh, between Hamas and Al Fatah, what in these internal dynamics, uh, uh, both in 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 both uh, parts of the territories, uh, how do you think this will impact on the relations inside the Palestinian politics, Maha? Um, thank you for having me on this uh, on this panel and with uh, Maria. Um, just very quickly, uh, certainly now with the October, I mean the post October seventh attack and everything that's happened in Gaza over the past uh, month, month and a half now almost, um, there is there is already work on quote unquote reconstituting the Palestinian Authority uh, and the internal dynamics within uh, amongst Palestinian groups. Uh, this is happening through a number of uh, formal and informal channels. Uh, there are plenty of interlocutors out there. I mean, this notion that we don't have anyone to talk to, no, there are plenty of people to talk to. 
But uh, the bottom line is this idea that Gaza and the West Bank can continue to be administered separately uh, as if they're two independent territories. One is, uh, you know, undermines the very notion uh, or the very idea of some sort of a peaceful resolution if we're still talking about the two-state solution even though I, I personally believe that a two-state solution is a uh, is incredibly tricky and probably almost very difficult to achieve at this point, given uh, all the uh, uh, the number, the growth in the number of settlements in the West Bank, the bypass roads. I mean, all the actions that have been taken over the past since Oslo over the past two decades make it very difficult to even conceive of a two-state solution. But ultimately, the idea that you would have two different entities representing different groups of Palestinians just is, is, is not feasible. So what we're looking at today is a reconstitution of the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority itself under Mahmoud Abbas is also defunct. It's lost its legitimacy. It's uh, known for its corruption, etc. So there is a real push today to bring perhaps all the different or at least a good variety of the groups, the Palestinian, different Palestinian groups and factions under one umbrella and some sort of a national a unity authority, I won't say government. Um, what I would warn in a situation like this, uh, having lived through national unity governments in a country like Lebanon, is when you have factions that have very different perceptions of how politics should be conducted, you also get into a kind of a veto, vetocracy situation where everybody can veto everyone else's, um, if you want, approach or policies. So I think we're in a very tricky situation. It's not just about reconstituting a, an authority that will rule over or govern uh, the West Bank and Gaza, but it's also about uh, an authority that has a homogeneous position. That's one. Two, they need to be able to, I mean, they need to have a partner on the Israeli side. And I think there we have a very big challenge uh, because it's very clear that the current Israeli government, which is uh, quite to the right, um, is actually talking about uh, the ethnic transfer uh, or ethnic cleansing in Gaza and in the West Bank. Uh, it's astonishing to see how much this notion is being mainstreamed we're hearing this from uh, former security personnel, current ministers, the prime and very different forms. So there is no partner for peace either at the, on the other side. Um, so the question is then, where is this going to go? And where this is going to go will have an impact on what we see amongst Palestinian factions. Just one last word on this is that the complexity of the situation within Palestinia, amongst Palestinians, uh, also means that we need to take into account the different factions that are also abroad. Again, I go back to Lebanon, where you have a diverse number of Palestinian factions that are in Lebanon and are still quite operational. And that includes Hamas. Yes, uh, it is indeed an extremely complex uh, situation. And, and now even the key issue of whether it is still feasible to have a two-state uh, solution, as we said, traditionally living peace side by side, we have so many problems that, uh, that have to be solved prior to that. <laughs> Kind we, of... We're living in a one-state reality. I mean, the bottom line is yes, to, yes, today yes. it is a one-state reality and it's an apartheid state because it has two legal systems for two different communities. It's th that's, the, that's where we are. With a peculiarity that uh, the, 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 the occupying power uh, is not taking responsibility and it's the international community that's taking responsibility for whatever can be done in help uh, to provide the necessary things for the situation. So we will come back to all of this. And now let me address the first question to uh, Maria Luisa uh, Fantapie. Uh, we are such in a, in a, in an extremely uh, serious uh, situation of uh, destruction and loss of, of life and everything 
Uh, now the question therefore is, will the ceasefire, a ceasefire be achieved in your opinion? Uh, by what mechanism can a ceasefire be possible? Uh, we need international agreements. Uh, there has to be probably foster exchanges, as it seems it's being negotiated now uh, with the intermediation of uh, the United States and some other countries in the Middle East. Uh, what can diplomacy do uh, so to achieve uh, a ceasefire? What's your opinion on that? Thank you, and thank you for having me in this panel with Maha. Um, well, uh, actually, the question of uh, uh, ceasefire, it's uh, one of the most difficult one to answer. Um, at this point, uh, um, the uh, United States have uh, made quite clear that uh, they will uh, not support a ceasefire unless there is a uh, release of the hostages uh, that Hamas uh, took um, on the 7th of October. This obviously also reflects the position of the uh, of the current Israeli government, who, because of domestic pressures, but also because of political strategy, wants uh, the issue of the hostages to be taking a priority. The logic there is that uh, there could not be a ceasefire without a release of um, hostages because um, the continuation of the war actually in their mind uh, continues to put pressures on Hamas and then finally will uh, force them and force their hand to um, release these hostages. That is why uh, most of the diplomacy these days uh, on, the, uh, on this conflict and on the ceasefire is happening in Doha, Qatar, uh, because also uh, on the one hand, Qatar has uh, ties with the political branches of Hamas uh, and also can, um, at least it tried to, to stand as an interlocutor of the West uh, and in specific the um, US and the, the, and the Europeans in, negotiation, in negotiating this release of the hostages. Um, uh, however, uh, we should, uh, I think, legitimately question whether this uh, strategy of conditioning the ceasefire to the release of the hostages is actually leading us anywhere. And if it is really leading us to the release of the hostages, it seems to me uh, that, uh, um, I mean, first of all, um, important to say that Arab states, in particular Jordan, but also the Gulf monarchies, um, most of the monarchies, including Saudi Arabia, have denounced and have distanced themselves from this American approach. They don't see uh, that the uh, they don't agree with the American position of conditioning the ceasefire to the release of hostages, and instead they call uh, uh, for uh, for ceasefire now. Um, uh, Foreign Minister of Jordan Ayman Safadi just a few days ago at the Manama Dialogue once again repeated his appeal for a ceasefire now, and uh, so this is a fundamental difference between the. American and Israeli position vis-a-vis um, -vis of the Arab position. Um, another important difference, which I think is worth mentioning, is that uh, the Americans uh, and the Israelis, they are actually asking the Arab counterpart to um, agree or to think about a post-war Gaza situation. So what will happen after um, Gaza, after the conflict? But frame it that way, it looks like that the uh, discussion is going to be mostly about uh, a sort of uh, co-opted administration that will rule this territory. And therefore, like uh, even here, uh, Jordanian foreign minister has been very clear a few days ago saying that Arab armies or Arab states will not wash what uh, will not actually make the cleanup of what um, uh, has been done by the Israelis. So um, I think that this point is very important because uh, on the Arab side, um, the position is not to discuss the post-war Gaza, but to uh, take this as a this tragic conflict also as an opportunity to settle uh, politically the Palestinian issue in a way or in another, whether it's in a two-state solution, but definitely to give um, to to chart a way towards statehood for the Palestinians, and uh, so this is another uh, important uh, um, question. So going back on last uh, um, instance to the, your question about the ceasefire, 
Uh, my personal opinion uh, from an analytical perspective is that uh, um, the politics of uh, the diplomacy of hostages, so basically conditioning the ceasefire to um, a release of hostages, is taking us all in hostage in one sense, because it's actually leading this conflict to continue. Uh, um, I might be wrong. I mean, I really hope there will be some achievements on these negotiations, but I do think that uh, this is a way uh, in which uh, first the war is going to continue and maybe even spill over because obviously the more time it continues, the more are the chances that also there will be a spillover. Second, by focusing all the diplomacy on the hostages, um, you implicitly actually uh, keep on legitimizing uh, the military faction of Hamas who have committed what they have committed as a, as a counterpart in the conflict. And third, you, by continuing the conflict, you are actually emboldening Iran and its proxies in the region because obviously every day that passes and every day that more um, Palestinian casualties um, are killed, uh, then the more the uh, Iranians and its, their proxies are actually claiming that they are the only one who have actually fought for the Palestinians uh, all over the years, while Arab states have instead normalized situation the, this, uh, the relation with Israel. And last but not least, obviously, the more that uh, this conflict continues, the more uh, the less I see the prospects for an Israeli-Arab reconciliation to take place. So um, I think we should really uh, question whether the American approach and the Israeli government approach, it's uh, the right one for, um, for diplomacy to succeed uh, um, and to really bring an end to the human sufferings and to the conflict. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Luisa. I think it's, uh, I have to, to, to let know with your permission to our listeners that we just arrived this morning uh, from Bahrain, uh, where these uh, talks were taking place at the highest level, including uh, responsible from all uh, big parties uh, trying to exercise this diplomacy and mediation, including uh, Borrell from the European side and, and the others. Okay, and, and, and so, uh, because you, you have uh, fresh news and, and a fresh impression of that, how should we situate the present dynamics in Palestine within the context of the region, especially you, men, uh, you mentioned the spillovers. What, what are the prospects for the, or not for a regional escalation of the conflict? Could that happen? I mean, everyone continues keep on saying that uh, uh, it's uh, no, that every, nobody wants a spillover of the conflict, even those actors like the Iranians who actually um, have are actually acquiring a lot of political capital from this conflict. Uh, they said that they don't want a spillover of this conflict, but... Um, uh, I mean, I think it's uh, it's uh, it's instead of like trying to read the crystal ball, it's more um, uh, of a question whether also this leadership in Israel at some point will think that uh, it's uh, well worth to provoke some uh, to to I mean continue the provocation on the Lebanese border and uh, and Maha is much more well placed than me to to actually answer this question related to whether there is going to be an expansion on. Uh, on the on on the Lebanon front, but what I can say uh, also beyond the uh, geographical expansion towards Lebanon is that somehow uh, the conflict has already not only expanded, it has globalized, and we see the it has regionalized because now already all the uh, plans that were ongoing before this conflict are now sort of uh, under question. So the idea of a a Gulf, uh, a, a hub of stability uh, within the Gulf and the regional stability and regional diplomacy, they have had a halt uh, and war seems to come back. At the same time, uh, in Europe, I think we already feel the shock waves of this conflict with uh, right wing and left wing uh, parties um, uh, sort of leveraging on this conflict narratives to uh, um, um, shore up uh, uh, support within their constituencies, the right wings, uh, conservative parties, uh, somehow leveraging on their pro-Israeli position to also spread somehow uh, some forms of 
anti-migrants um, uh, and Islamophobic behavior. And, um, uh, and on the other hand, also, this uh, obviously fuels also some dangerous phenomenon of anti-Semitism within our own European content. So I think, I think that it's really the question of the spillover. It's already there in some, in some way. This is so, and, and the danger of it, it's not only for the Middle East, it's also for the Europeans. Because this conflict not only is uh, it, I mean, is also testing our ability to uh, to sort of uh, stand up for 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 values and principles we have claimed to defend, but also to um, prevent that this war will become a war of identities, <laughs> and and I think that this is a very dangerous uh, turn that the war will turn. But on the expansion, I will leave it to also Maha, who is uh, right on the field, uh, and so she could uh, maybe contribute yeah. much better than me. Thank you, thank you. Yes, uh, we'll turn to uh, Maha uh, Yaya. Uh, so regarding the future relations between Israel and the Arab countries, and also taking into account the Arab public opinions, uh, namely the support, of course, uh, to the Palestinians, what is the future of the Abraham Accords and the normalization process? So this question, let me just say a couple of words on the regional spillover. It's already there. We're not talking about the regional spillover that has not happened. Today, there have been, for the past 40 days, there have been altercations between Israel and Hezbollah uh, in, uh, on Lebanon's southern border. Um, Two days ago, they, I mean, and the altercation has been happening, the expansion or the intensification has been happening both vertically and horizontally, meaning it's not a question of the conflict going from zero to 100 in one shot. But what we've seen over the past more or less 40 days is that the area, the geographic area that is being covered in the conflict has been expanding from two kilometers on either side of the border to 16. Two days ago, uh, it, went, it went into uh, 40 or 50 kilometers away from the border, at least within Lebanese territory. The kinds of weapons and uh, the number of, of altercations every day that we're seeing is also increasing. So there already is a regional spillover. Um, and it's a slippery slope. We're seeing attacks happening against American troops in Iraq and Syria. We saw a tanker yesterday, uh, an Israeli tanker uh, being uh, uh, hijacked by the Houthi movement in Yemen. So uh, we're seeing rockets fired from Iraq into Israel, first time since 1990 in the Iraq war, but also from Syria. So there are already regional spillovers. Until now, they've, they remain contained. And I think that neither uh, Iran nor the US want to see this expand. And I think this is the big question today. The problem is that it's a slippery slope and there are too many moving parts and too many semi, I would say, independent entities, whether it's uh, the different groups operating on the Lebanese border, whether it's in Syria, whether it's Iraq, or whether the Houthis. Iran came out and said, we have nothing to do with the hijacking of the tanker by the Houthis in Yemen. So it's a slippery slope and too many variables that are playing, which means it could, and this is not to mention the military buildup uh, by the Americans, the UK and other Europeans in the Mediterranean, in and around the Mediterranean. If you look at the map today and look at how many uh, tankers are, are in the region, it's frightening. The amount of naval military power that is in the region today uh, and in the Mediterranean. So I think these are all uh, questions that uh, are, I mean, I, I believe that Iran today uh, is not, it's trying to capitalize on this politically. I agree with Maria, but it is not interested in a war that will end up with a zero sum game. Um, and that will destroy everything it has invested. On the Abraham Accords, um, just to respond to your question, I think the Abraham Accords, at least, there are two kinds. I mean, there was the one that there are the ones that have already been signed uh, between uh, Israel, uh, the UAE, Bahrain, uh, and Morocco. 
these are still uh, valid. I don't see a backtracking on them. In fact, the Emiratis have come out very clearly and said that we're not backtracking on the on the uh, on the Abraham Accords. What the Abraham Accords were doing and what they started doing through, the, especially the one between the UAE and Israel, was to try and put today a new uh, to put in place a new security and economic architecture that totally ignored the Palestinians and assumed that you know, life goes on. We just put a new security architecture um, that is reliant on these relationships between the Gulf and Israel, and you bypass all of the Levant. This has proved to be a false assumption, uh, and it's, you know, questionable. And the idea that is today, you cannot have peace, security, and stability in the region without addressing the Palestinian issue. The other part of the Abraham Accords is the discussion that was happening, the negotiations that were happening between the KSA, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and Israel. Had that been signed, that was, this would really have left the Palestinians, uh, I mean, to my mind, it would have been kind of the final nail in the coffin of any dreams about Palestinian statehood, in part because Saudi Arabia is the most, is the country with the most political and economic weight in the region. Um, so already the Palestinians were feeling befra, be, uh, that had they had been abandoned by their Arab uh, cohorts, if you like. And I think this is also what allowed Iran to move into this space over the past three years and rebuild its relationship with Hamas. The Abraham Accord with Saudi Arabia, I think, is today is in deep freeze. Uh, I don't think it will. I think that, and this is there is concern around this. It is in deep freeze. Uh, it will be back on the table once a political, uh, you know, once there is discussion and negotiation around what kind of political solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict could look like. The worry here is that this kind of political solution, if not done properly, could end up being, paying simply lip service to this idea of Palestinian statehood or what a one-state solution could look like if we're going to go on a one-state solution, which then, you know, demands a lot of hard responses from Israel, um, uh, that this could end up being simply paying lip service and then we go back to, you know, life as normal. Um, bottom line is, Saudi Arabia is in deep freeze for now. The others are continuing. And how do you assess uh, the, the the contradiction that might appear between the public opinions, the Arab street, as usually said, and and uh, the governments in power in the Arab world? Because um, it is well known, and we we recall the experiences uh, back in two thousand and three, especially uh, when there was really a big movement, uh, and it was. Well, the, the, the Arab regimes had to maneuver uh, according as um, one of the very important factors what was going on internally in the country because of, there was the, the eruption uh, of, uh, of, of the public opinion and the demonstration, etc., as it is happening now. So these dynamics between uh, uh, public opinion in the Arab uh, countries and governments, uh, do you think that this will could lead to some destabilization or uh, how, how do you assess that? I think our public opinion today is actually pushing their governments to take up a, very, a more pro-Palestinian position than some of them might have. Um, there's no doubt in my mind. However, I would say that our public opinion and the, at least the political uh, rhetoric coming out of Arab governments uh, are far more in line than what we've seen in the United States, for example, or even in some countries in Europe. There, I mean, I've just been doing a lot of briefings, and there you see there's a real decalage, there's a real schism between the, what the politicians are saying and what people are talking about and the demonstrations, etc., in the region here, it's made it very difficult for even countries that have signed the Abraham Accords um, to take up any kind of public position that is contrary, that, 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 that does not at least at minimum 
ask for a complete ceasefire. We're talking about already 15,000 almost, 15 to 20,000. I mean, the official number, I think, is 12 to 13,000 people have died. Uh, the unofficial number, there to there's a discussion of around five to 7,000 people uh, under the rubble. Half of those are children. I mean, the, the situation is just catastrophic. Um, the questions around what the day after will look like are also of such magnitude um, that there's going to there there needs to be a lot of uh, you know support around that, and this is where I think our public opinion is playing an important role. Okay, so thank you, thank you. Let me turn now to Maria Luisa because she is coming now with fresh news from the area. Uh, she has participated and been uh, uh, around in, in this uh, senior level uh, rounds in Bahrain these days. Uh, so, uh, how have you uh, seen the role of regional powers? Uh, and I would stress the point because you, you, you know it specifically, uh, the role of Iran and, and of course, uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar and Egypt, the, which is the, the, the diplomatic role of, of regional powers. What, what can we expect of them? Yes, so I mean, in, in, um, it's still very unclear because I think that everyone is um, in a state of, of of confusion. And so there are several initiatives uh, ongoing. As I was mentioning before, immediately after uh, the conflict started, especially Qatar uh, sort of tried to be the magnet of uh, Western diplomacy hosting talks over the hostages. And I think this will go on, especially as long as the United States uh, priority and Israel prioritize that over the ceasefire. However, there are other initiatives that are ongoing coming from the wider Gulf. Um, one uh, uh, relates to Saudi Arabia, who just uh, at this uh, Manama dialogue, um, after uh, consultations uh, with uh, uh, other states and also uh, European Union High Representative Joseph Borrell, um, put up a statement saying that uh, they are going to um, want to lead uh, together with the Islamic and Arab countries an initiative uh, for uh, peace, an initiative that uh, will aim not only at uh, um, uh, uh, proposing a ceasefire, but also at uh, um, uh, designing what could be uh, a recognition of some sort of like a, a political solution for the Palestinian issue, although it's very vague in which form this will, will be. Uh, then I will come back to it. And the idea is that uh, Saudi Arabia will actually use its uh, diplomatic, financial, um, and global leverage. Uh, and especially as uh, we remind everyone who is listening that Saudi Arabia in the last years, uh, especially after um, the Chinese Arab summit, uh, it has really tried to be uh, within the region a hub for um, global powers uh, and having relations with both China and the United States. So um, in the way in which uh, they will, I think that what they will try to do is to try to actually bring behind this uh, Arab peace initiative that they will lead the major global powers, at least the P5 of the UN Security Council. Um, uh, Foreign Minister Farhan, uh, Saudi Foreign Minister Farhan already mentioned that uh, he will travel first to China to uh, actually discuss this. And, um, and so but I think, and so then there will be also other uh, discussion about how other uh, global power can uh, support this initiative. What I see as uh, um, as difficult in this uh, Saudi uh, initiative is that uh, un un um, un until the United States actually continue to uh, give priority to hostage release rather than a peace conference or a peace talk, I mean, I don't think that uh, the, the Saudi will be really able to um, to conclude anything. So uh, I think that the idea of going to China is also uh, in the usual way of uh, somehow edging between China and the United States, trying to convince and persuade the United States to put their diplomatic weights behind Saudi Arabia in this. Um, I think that there is a, a sort of good news for us as Europeans, because uh, um, I can tell you that uh, Borrell 
has been extremely active uh, during this Manama Forum to try to support the Arab leaders uh, uh, in uh, constant discussions with uh, both uh, the Jordanians, the Saudis, uh, the Bahrainis, precisely uh, to support the idea of an Arab Peace Conference, which could settle uh, the um, uh, and which could be the framework, provide the framework for the Palestinian um, issue to be addressed any as a, as a whole and not just as a post-war Gaza. So I think that uh, at least from Joseph Borrell we see um, a sort of a European shift towards uh, um, uh, more support for the Arab diplomatic initiative, while, as we all remember, in the first day of the conflict, uh, uh, another high-level European official, uh, um, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the uh, president of the European Commission, she had uh, instead uh, given a totally opposite sign uh, by traveling to Israel and giving unconditional support for, for Israel. So I think that uh, here we are a bit at the crossroad where Arab states are trying to gather also um, global support over, over a peace proposal. Uh, Europe can have a very important role if it uh, chooses, I think, this side. Uh, I think it's in the, in the interest of the European uh, member states, but also in Europe, to uh, the interest of the credibility of Europe to actually do so uh, and slightly differ from the United States position. Uh, so we hope that this uh, diplomatic in this second diplomatic initiative will continue. However, I want to go back to something that Maha said. In order to have a negotiation, you also need to have a counterpart on the other side. So, I mean, you can put up a plan and you can even think about, of a, I don't know, of a PLO where um, a Palestinian, uh, I mean, to rethink the Palestinian authorities uh, and uh, uh, in the framework of the younger generation leaders that are not uh, as those one who are uh, considered very, um, uh, very, uh, um, you know, that they're not credible any longer. You can think also of introducing perhaps some elements of the uh, political wing of Hamas. Uh, I mean, but the problem is uh, that you also need a counterpart in Israel. So the question that every single interlocutor I spoke to in Manama, it was like, uh, okay, we can deliver somehow a peace plan. We can like together with the Palestinians, uh, but at the same time, we need the U.S. to deliver an Israeli counterpart because with this um, Israeli government, there is no other counterpart to speak to. So once again, I think it also um, the future of this conflict is also very much lies in the ability of the United States to understand whether other people that rather than Netanyahu who are. I think more sensible to, to a broader solution to this conflict uh, could be empowered. Uh, the name of uh, Lapid, Yair Lapid and Gans have been mentioned several times. I think that the idea is also how to um, convince and persuade the Israelis that if they actually uh, uh, walk towards um, uh, an encounter with, uh, an, I mean, not necessarily a physical one, but at least a diplomatic uh, di dialogue, uh, even if it's mediated by someone else uh, with, the, with the Arab states, uh, this could have enormous also advantages for them because it could also save the normalization process that they have invested on. While this track they are work working on is basically antagonizing uh, them, um, uh, all the Middle East. And so I, I guess that uh, uh, voices against Netanyahu approach uh, are already present in Israel, but there is ne a need for a much more forceful, let's say, um, diplomatic push from the United States and also, uh, you know, a, a good strategic uh, approach also from the Arab states in order to understand how can how they can leverage, especially Saudi Arabia, on the prospect of a, a renewed uh, discussion on normalization with Saudi Arabia against also a substantive plan, accepted plan on, 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 Palest on Palestine. Thank you. So thank you, Maria Luisa. The problem is that we we seem to be in this respect kind of a, in a vicious circle because uh, we should we would need somebody else in government in Israel more prone to negotiation, and we would need a younger a younger generation taking over in in the in the in the Palestinian Authority. But we have none of that. Uh, uh, so we have we'll have to work with what uh, we have. Uh, that's uh, the complication of the issue. But since we were talking about the 
uh, European uh, position, let me introduce one of the questions that were raised by our listeners who were uh, questioning, were putting the following question, who will pay for the reconstruction? Uh, because this is one of the ingredients in the negotiation itself. Uh, uh, but, uh, well, usually, as I said before, uh, it was the Europeans who pay for the reconstructions and uh, Americans rather pay for the, 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 the weapons needed to conduct the war and, and uh, the occupiers uh, don't take care of what, what about the reconstruction? Who will pay for that? What's the prospect? Is that part of the negotiations right now, Maria Luisa? Um, I think, uh, I don't know for what I am aware of, at this point, uh, we are mm, more focused on the ceasefire itself than the reconstruction. I mean, um, I think also there is, uh, if we look at other cases uh, like uh, post-ISIS Iraq, uh, I mean, this issue of the reconstruction, it's somehow um, a very delicate one because uh, it's, uh, I think it's very important not to uh, do as Europeans as we sometimes do, that we think that if we channel money, we can just be in peace with our conscience, you know, and say, okay, we give money to, to humanitarian aid, we, dig, we give money to the reconstruction of the Palestinians in Gaza. And this has been a, a lot uh, Ursula von der Leyen approach these days, not saying I have double, tripled, I don't know the, but I mean, now really the usual the, European approach. Yeah, yeah. And so, and I think that this, uh, we have seen in several situations that it cost us uh, as European money and it actually doesn't bring uh, any um, any good to the to the region in the sense that we uh, now it's the time and it, to speak about uh, uh, a solution for the how to reach a ceasefire first, how to persuade uh, the Israeli side to reach a ceasefire, and then at the same, at the same time how to um, uh, to really um, have these two counterparts that you were mentioning. I do not think that uh, I mean I agree that it's a very difficult pathway to to have the two sides. I think that uh, from my conversation. Um, it's uh, it, the bad news is that none of them are there, but at the same time, there is a regional diplomacy happening, at least on the Palestinian side, to I mean, uh, at least on the Arab side, to sort of uh, work on this. Now, uh, the, 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 as I said, we need to create and need to understand what are the right incentives for the Israelis to actually uh, also, you know, um, uh, be interested in a negotiation. I, as I said, I don't think that this specific leader and this specific government could be, but others uh, could maybe be uh, very interested in seeing uh, progress on the Israeli-Palestinian issue within the broader framework of the Israel-Arab relation, if there is this uh, this sort of like uh, um, uh, framework of, of, of diplomatic negotiation, and if the United States support, uh, obviously, this process. Thank you, thank you. I understand the preoccupation of our listeners. It's kind of more of an accusation than a question, I think. Uh, who will pay for that? Is Europe going to take the usual approach just to put money and okay, well, but let me turn to uh, 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 to Amaha Yaya with another question because you know very well the situation in Lebanon and in the region. How do you uh, see the impact, the internal impact on the stability and social consequences in in in, in specifically in Lebanon and uh, what uh, will the impact as well in the countries in the area, the internal situation? Uh, for example, in Syria, of course, uh, even in Iraq, how do you, but specifically in in Lebanon, maybe because it's 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 such an, uh, an, uh, an uh, in a complicated situation. Thank you. I'm I'm just going to say a couple of words about reconstruction, and then I'll say uh, I'll I'll talk about Lebanon. Um, just to say that the question of reconstruction is not just a technical issue, and it's not about who pays. Uh, ultimately, the EU may contribute, but uh, probably Arab states will also contribute. But it all depends on what is finally agreed to. Uh, we're not talking simply about rebuilding. Uh, the discussion now is that 40 to 50%, I think, of Gaza's, Gaza's housing has been completely 
destroyed, but we're also talking about uh, uh, clearing up minefields. We're talking about rebuilding an economy, rebuilding a lifestyle. Otherwise, we will end up with a tent city uh, for two million people for a very long time to go. So the, the the question of payment is secondary to what kind of ultimate uh, solution will be put forward on the table, um, and then. I think different countries will have to contribute. On Lebanon itself, the conflict is, um, I mean, so far it's remained contained. Um, what we're hearing now is, you know, there, there's a lot of concern actually before. There's a lot of concern that uh, the mindset of some Israeli policymakers, some of those in government, but also some members of the security service, is that since the world is with us right now um, and everybody's showing support, uh, complete or this kind of blanket support, then um, we are going to go in and also once we're done with Hamas, we're going to go in and deal with Hezbollah immediately after. There's a real, we, we already are seeing the shift in the mindset of the political and security establishment from a deterrence to kind of more preemptive strikes, etc. And this is incredibly worrisome uh, and is very concerning for both the Lebanese, but I think also for the region, because going after Hezbollah in Lebanon not only uh, will totally destabilize an already unstable situation in Lebanon with the economic and financial collapse, and now the political deadlock, but will have even more of a regional spillover um, than we are currently seeing, in part because uh, I mean, at the end of the day, Hezbollah is the crown jewel uh, of Iran's partners and proxies across the region. And it's actually probably the most important actor on the scene today uh, of all of Iran's partners. Hassan Nasrallah plays a very important role, not only in working with the Iranians, but also even in terms of coordinating amongst the different uh, proxy fighters, or proxy groups, sorry, uh, in the region. So there, there's a lot of concern around that uh, and what, what the kind of ripple effects that we, we could have there. Um, on the political front, um, there is now talk that should, the, should there be a political solution for uh, that is mapped out for uh, Gaza, then it's possible that um, in a part of that package uh, will also include some sort of a political solution for Lebanon as well, which will address Hezbollah's arms without uh, an all-out conflict. Let there is there is the beginning. Yes, uh, uh, let me close it to this because there are questions uh, from the, our listeners that are uh, going in, uh, coming in. Um, how do you see the role of Syria in all of this, especially with the Golan still occupied and a number of Palestinian groups residing there? Uh, so, because we were talking about the countries in the region and, and about Syria. Syria will, I mean, Syria is an easier, if you want, easier and not easier. It's uh, it's not about the Syrian government. It's about all the different groups that are active there. We already saw uh, some, uh, what, some uh, missiles being shot out of Syria and attacks against uh, also American uh, bases there. Um, Israel has more of a free hand to also bomb Hezbollah and Iran uh, positions in Syria, as we've seen over the last decade or so. Um, so I think Syria is more of a is a less less controllable, if you long, if you like, uh, arena uh, for more conflagration in the region. Um, and some of the escalation that we might see will happen from there, most likely. Um, there are lots of true, uh, groups operating. I mean, we saw the reactivation of Iran-affiliated proxies like Fatimi Yun and Zainab Yun. We've been hearing about the movement of some groups from Iraq to, or some 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 fighters from Iraq to uh, Syria. Um, there is there is a buildup, but it's not huge. Let's not forget the Russians have also a significant presence there. There's a UN presence. And as I said, Israel has more of a, you know, American presence and Israel has more of a hand in terms of uh, 
uh, going after uh, Iran and uh, Hezbollah positions there. Let me introduce maybe, I don't know to whom of you, uh, uh, a specific question that, that uh, has uh, come from our listeners, and I read it. Is, it, uh, is there, according to the panel, any chance that Marwan Barwati, who is serving a long-term time prison sentence in Israel, will appear on the scene sooner or later? I think it's very difficult. I I mean, he was imprisoned in part because of that, because he has the potential and he's incredibly popular. And if he were to be released, um, he he would, uh, I don't know how effective a leader he would be, but he definitely would be voted in. Uh, he's a very popular, he's, I mean, it, some people see him as the Nelson Mandela of the Palestinians. I'm not so sure, but anyway, some people see him as the Nelson Mandela of the Palestinians, and it might be, I mean, he's someone that they can rally around, but whether the Israelis would agree to release him, I'm I'm, I'm not so sure. Definitely not this current government. Yeah, probably we are still at an early stage in negotiations uh, to see how this will evolve. Uh, since we are running out of time, let me put a final question uh, this time then. Uh, to Maria Luisa, uh, one of the questions for, from our uh, listeners, uh, which is, what can be the role of the European public opinion in moving toward the recognition of the Palestinian cause? And I would enlarge the question to influence uh, in a positive way in uh, the negotiations in Paris. I think that uh, uh, the first of all, the Arab states and the Arab leaders are very uh, sensitive and very attentive to the uh, European public opinion. Uh, even these discussions in Manama, many times uh, counterparts from the Middle East told me that uh, they had been uh, quite impressed on how European societies have uh, mobilized their and shown their support to to the Palestinian. Uh, here in my apartment, just uh, three floors be uh, below, uh, there is someone who put the Palestinian flag on his <laughs> on his window. Uh, so I think that you know, as I said before, there is uh, definitely a, um, a sense that this conflict is also very much felt across the European societies. Now, the however, the thing that I I, I feel like saying is that it's very important. Uh, for us as citizens of Europe not to uh, fall into this uh, uh, into this divisive view of either supporting Israel or supporting the Palestinian and then, you know somehow our governments especially governments in the in Europe which have taken a very pro israeli stand have helped this divisive process whereby then uh, public opinion has rallied on the exactly opposite side. I think that uh, we should be uh, very, um, I mean, the way that we can contribute is to say that we want uh, a respect for international law on both sides, that uh, we feel confident in uh, denouncing both the attacks that happened uh, uh, by the hand of Hamas and attack that happened uh, and they like disproportionate response that uh, actually was conducted by Israel uh, and really try to um, I'm sorry to sound a bit like maybe uh, banal in saying but really uh, to to be an advocate for peace in this moment I mean so many Arab foreign ministers have are now speaking like uh, any European leaders should speak, speaking about international law, speaking about peace, speaking about ceasefire now. And I think that as citizens of Europe, personally, I feel almost more represented by them than any other. So I think that, again, to be for a Palestinian cause, it doesn't mean to be, for example, degenerative and saying, OK, and attacking Israel. It means to work and be supportive for a um, uh, for a peaceful solution of this conflict and asking for a ceasefire, so we should absolutely also condemn. I think all uh, signs uh, of uh, anti-Semitism that have, are shown like across Europe. This is terrible. This is horrible. This is not working for for peace. This is working for division and polarization. 
And this will make even more the, uh, the Israeli convinced that uh, they are right in what they're doing. So uh, again, a responsible position from citizens of Europe that uh, work for peace and work against this uh, dichotomy of being against or being pro uh, one side. That is what I think it's most uh, uh, the best contribution that we can make to this, uh, to, to the peaceful resolution of this conflict. So thank you very much, really. We've run out of time. Uh, we try to keep our commitments uh, regarding uh, the, the, the schedule. Uh, thank you. Your contributions have been extremely useful to understand uh, this difficult situation. And let's hope that, uh, well, we can, we can see a positive evolution and a ceasefire and a, and a, a fruitful negotiation, although it looks uh, very grim uh, uh landscape by now and so but before we we go off uh, anthem uh remind that we will have our third uh, uh webinar which will 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 work will will be on more or less what you were saying now uh maria luisa it will be held on the 23rd november at noon under the title shaping narratives of the conflict and their global effects eh? we will have with us uh, Dina Matar, who's the director uh, for the Center for Global Media and Communications, and uh, uh, Nureddin Miladi, head of the Department of Mass Communication at Qatar University, and uh, facilitator, uh, substituting myself, in uh, will be uh, Gemma Ovarell, who's the director of Culture, Gender, and Civil Society Department here at the European Institute of the Mediterranean. And we will try, as, as usually, to do our best uh, for the region. So thank you really very much for being with us. Thank you to all the listeners. Uh, I hope that this uh, webinar uh, will uh, has been uh, fruitful to try to understand what's going on, because it's difficult, difficult really to understand.